everyone, Martinez, Christine, we are both uh, data types engineers at Isavelan, which is now part of Cisco. And as data types engineers, we tend to think that 80% of our time we spend coding, but in reality, it's 80, more than 80% of time just troubleshooting. So to ease our pain, we ended up building a debugger, which we'll be talking today. And it's going to be a good dog pudding example, as we'll be using BPF to troubleshoot BPF data types. And in this example, we hit some uh, limitations, which we have to work around in a creative way. We'll be talking about that. So when it comes to Linux containers networking, uh, we have quite a few layers of virtualization. So in this case, it's physical network devices and some plumbing in between. And even if it's a data plane, we still have the standard Linux uh, networking stack. And if you zoom in the screen win, you end up seeing many functions which are involved in a packet processing, in the packet types and pictures from uh, Linux Foundation Wiki page. And I think it's still 2.6 kernel, and since then a lot has changed and even more complex. So finding a couple of fun packets in a cold cache uh, some, somewhat resembles finding Valdo, just that in the Valdo cache we have our eyes as a reliable tool. And when it comes to troubleshooting, we have a bit more limited tools. So the obvious one is to keep putting some weakness, but this is uh, just uh, unreliable in a way that we are just increasing the feedback uh, loop and the delay when it comes to finding the problem. So like, especially in the environments where we cannot just SSH. And yeah, like as a debug statement, if your customer asks to run, the customer provides you a some new trace logs and then you start from the beginning. And the existing solutions, uh, which I listed just a few, so the obvious one is PPT dump. So PPT dump is a bit too coarse grained because a lot of things happen in between PCP dump hook points. Then the uh, second one is of course the PPF trace and we use quite a lot. So basically we just operate the trace hook to the STB function and then get the uh, kernel stack which led to that execution of that function but uh, we found that it's quite <laughs> filtering becomes uh, cumbersome so you need to you can access the all parameters which in this case is the SSB but using the TCP level filters it can become and also it requires a compiler another tool uh, IP is called PS Trace 2, which was built by our uh, colleague Yotaro. It's uh, very old and fast. It's basically uh, doing similar what we do, but it's relying on the STB mark. And in the BPF data planes, again, like we rely quite a lot on STB marks for filtering the state between function executions in the uh, data plane. So the STB mark becomes a no go. So we ended up building our own tool uh, called Packet Where You or pronounced Peru and we open source it. And if you basically change the, the output it provides, you can use the PC. I'm not sure whether it's still but you can basically provide TCP dump style uh, filters and then you can get the, all the metadata you're interested for troubleshooting. And in this case, we have an IP school tool which is dropping some traffic. And we can clearly see it from the trace log what happened with the packet which we filtered. And uh, okay, so unfortunately, <laughs> one slide got dropped, but basically, the simplified idea of the tool is that we parse the kernel's BPF or kernel module's BPF. We find all the functions which are stacked in STB and extract them. And then we attach. Uh, filtering programs to those functions via uh, asymmetry or a paper, which we call it multi. 
take them from the user space. And those programs are pushing the events into the queue, sent from the user space where you're reading like some magic tree tree. And you can run this tool as a standalone binary. It's a statically linked binary, no external dependencies, and uh, it's less than 10 megabytes, so it's easy to distribute to your customers. Uh, but you can, you can also run it as a standalone Docker, in a standalone Docker container, and basically run it from there. But you need a privileged one. And for us, premium developers, our target platform is Kubernetes, so we can run it on the Kubernetes side, and we can decide on which nodes to run. And then, finally, uh, last but not least, is GitHub Actions. And it has been used to debug our CI flakes quite a lot. And then another use case which I didn't list is basically when you have a multi-cluster environment and you want to run it locally, we can do it on our laptops and then we can display to basically a way to run Cilium on multi-node inside your laptop is one kind, but you can cluster in Docker containers. And then you basically, with the tool, because it's all everything runs inside your host, you can see the cluster view of the package and you can see all nodes. So yeah, I'm here in Gray who was implementing some advanced functionality. So the first, uh, so the very first version were very not flexible. So we had a bunch of maps where we could add some filters like IP, destination IP, source IP, destination port, source port, the protocol. And then we started hitting some limitation with this kind of filtering. So Started to work around. I mean, if you're able to get a point of point. So, okay, thank you. So, then they talk about how to implement this to become like filters. Um, so, in general, it's a very simple three step that you have to complete as a filter exception to KBTS using from like GitHub Pickup. So there's a certain rich list the uh, frames where the least significant, significant bit of the upper of the spectrum field is available. Then the uh, Pickup function can compile this exception to KBTS so with, with the first operate. Explain more? No. Okay. Anyway. Uh, so the second step is we convert the KBTS to EGTS using the KBTS tool. There's a function inside this library which can convert KBTS to EBTS from here. Then the last step, we are injecting generated EBTS into rules. So the idea is like this. Um, so generally, generally speaking, to run a BTS program, the clone will compile the BTS B code into BTS object. Then a library will read that BTS object to a user space memory. In finally, a, we will load that BTS object to the kernel. So th there's a movement that we can do this injection where it's just after we read the BTS object, BTS object in the user space memory, but before loading to kernel. So that's when we inject the BTS. Uh, okay, so we are talking about some details. To compile this into CBTS, need to um, download a function from like Pickup. So using Golang, it's very easy. Just to disable Seagulls and specify the C flag, the C flag, specify the position of like Pickup, include the link to the header, and convert the string to C string. Initialize a CPTF buffer and call the function Pickup to compile from like Pickup. Then we can have CBTF. But the key point here is we have to compile the like we have ourselves because we have to enable a we have to enable the debug. So that's the only way to basically link the like we have. Next, next we are converting CBTS to EBTS using cluster space BTS tool. The API here is to EBTS function. We pass it the CBTS and return EBTS. So for example this has been compiled to this has been compiled to CBTS in the step one and this API will convert this 
it is a two-bit pair. But the problem here is that the first pair DB pair is using derivative. Very fair, we we reject this derivative DB pair because only a few types of programs are allowed to use derivative derivative. So to solve this problem, we would have to scan all the converted EB pair to find all the derivative edges, but then can convert all these derivative edges to the derivative edges by different help of calling. So we have, we have to call the EB pair help of the EB probe kernel function. In this case example, so we, are, we, we want to read the value printed by eyeball to the eyeball. So first we have to we have to read this value to the stack first and read this value from stack to the So we have to say term minus k, which is the stack. So we R1. Then R2 is the diagonal value, which is one byte. R3 is the data source. Then we call this data helper to, to take the data to stack. And then finally, we can move the value from stack to register R0. So why do we not not to do Thing because we are using additional register here on R1 and R2. We always want to use only R4 and R1, but conversion we are using additional registers R1 to R3. And these three registers can could be already used. So to, to solve this conflict, we have to store the R1 to R3 to stack before the conversion and restore the R1 to R3 from stack after the conversion. So we can say all this one this instruction has to be converted to this to, re to store the stack, to convert to BK4 and restore the register to some stack. Then we are injecting generated stack to Peru. So Peru leaves the H star function to the third BK of EP to EB pair. Then the first two parameters are CD pointers, which are not actually used. They are used in this function, but this all the whole function body will be replaced by our generated EP pair. So th they are here because we need at least three registers to be available to do the conversion. So they are here. So we have R1, R3 registers available, and R0, which is from the return value. The fourth and the fifth parameters are escape data and escape data earning. They are too necessary to do the conversion. So we have to pass R4 and R5 in this two options to do the proper conversion. Then Peru will scan the original BPS, eBPS opcode to find the symbol function and replace the function body with whatever we have generated in the step two. And then load the new BPS opcode to the command. And that's how we do this. And it typically sounds like Peter's. In this part, we are talking about BPS program tracing. So, what, what, what is this? So, if you look at this typical um, output, so still this packet uh, is received by this native, and then it was replaced by TCBPS. And then TCBPS is classified as the indicator of TCBP program. Then, yeah, TCBPS with red is the another native is the To highlight this fact that okay, I think it's net with a strong ten dot equal four dot three dot one six to a new X P low value. The equal four stack is one seven two dot twenty one dot four two. So my question is which part of code in the TCDB pair is responsible for this net? I mean just look at this this command. This net shows the BPS uh, BPS program kill code junk. Which part of the uh, program does this net? We have no idea. Peru doesn't tell us. So to solve this problem, the first naive, not naive, the first natural approach is to control to catch another BP program. So in this case, we, we require to use two probes to attach the TC EBP program. We, unfortunately, kernel doesn't allow this because this kernel function check it every, every step will uh, will error if the two probes are 
obvious to a lot of these people when you know, people would not but also we can we can use it actually to appeal to other vehicle when it's a lot of you know traffic and so therefore this thing is is working because also the battery attaching is working by replacing the bike by instructions in the program of the DC program. So when a DC program is running the the traveling will be executed first, then only observe the DC program running. And so for tracing the so in that case the program A is still calling the program B the, the program B signal will be skipped by the vehicle jumping. So Basically, you can attach the new program, but the vehicle tracing the actually doesn't happen. So it definitely will be skipped. So another solution is to use CPU to hide all the DC pumpers. Uh, so those first will scan the core to collect all the existing DC pumper functions in kernel. Then we will attach the DC program on all these pumpers. Program will do the following things. So it will unwind the thing to calculate the ID. So if you are familiar with DC helper, there's already a helper in kernel like DC helper ID. So there is a simplified version doing the similar thing. We unwind the stash to the root and get something stash as the stack ID. So in this case, all the functions in the same coin chain will have the same stack ID. Can read the key pointer from a BTS map for the stack ID. So, if the KB pointer was stored by other other functions before BT helper, because they are on the same coin chain, so the stack ID is the same. So we we are confident in that case. In that case, we can we can get the KB pointer. We can collect the necessary information we want, like the source, the late date, which is Pointer, the key point is that we additionally collect the caller pieces. So that even the caller pieces can be converted to symbol according to the caller PO themes. And the, the symbol gives information of the program name, the info sale call program. So that is the example. So originally we have we have this program also to show um, give more information about DC. So, enable, by enabling the DC helper tracing, we can see there's an additional coverage during the corner program. So, let's see if I can see this. So, it shows this program, the, the package was received by this because this is a this. And then it enters the TC eBPS program. The first DC helper gets called is DC SCB event output. Program CPM from container, so this is the first DC program. Then the SCB gets teleport to the second DC program, the second handle IPv4. And after a while, the first one gets called SCB, second handle IPv4 continues. And finally, the last one gets teleport to the local with DNS English V4. By looking at the SCB people, we can clearly see that everything has happened in the process I offered this thing. So we have last DC program the with DNS, local with DNS. So yeah, enable, in, enabling this way we can we can understand how the program is running inside in detail. So obviously this is so roughly speaking the DC program because it could be much more helpful if you, if you can collect and parse the arguments exactly for BTS map functions. However, as long as we have the maps for map D and map value, then we can just simply call the helper BTS and print it with the kernel and parse it out and give us the string. So it's very convenient. And another main tool for me, I think, is the simple output. Is the simple output shown by BTS tool, by the BTS tool program dump. So you can see the source code is already there in kernel because plugin doesn't skip the source code. Uh, so the, all the debugging for, for the symbols are there in the 
the new kernel. So we need to protect the most important information and send a lot with the BCD helper so we can kill the helper for the what they call bonding source code because it's very helpful for developers to debug. Okay, so yeah. Next part, we are talking about XBC switching and XBC tracing. So some features we have already mentioned before. XBC tracing, so by enabling the flag filter, the flag filter trace the XBP, we can, we, can, we can also trace the XBP program. The XBP program has been inherited the the system as it is uh, implemented by using SM trace as part of the XBP program and also apply the same BP filter to the same injection we introduced before into the filter on the XBP tracing. The next is the XQB. XQB is the default mode. So, so I want to highlight three points that describe this filter for XQB. So as we said, Prune filters XQB by using a TQB down filter. But by enabling this flag, we can track XQBs by pointer addresses. Very useful when net encapsulation encryption happens. For example, the original attack it could be um, made in the TCAP, TCAP down like filters. After a while, the attack it would be encrypted to, to the encrypted one. After encryption, we can no longer match the filter because it's all the panels are encrypted. But by just enabling this flag, we can still trace in the XQB because their pointer address remains the same. So it's a, it's a very convenient way to understand its XQB lifetime. Then the second point is the filter non-XQB function. So Martinez mentioned before, Peru or originally was implemented by tracing all the kernel functions whose parameters have XQB pointer. So, but enable this fact, we can also trace any kernel functions even without XQB parameter. This is done by stack ID, as we introduced before. So we connect stack ID, so all the functions in the same pony chain could have the same stack ID. So functions can retrieve the XQB pointer from the basic map and collect information from that XQB. So yeah, in this way, even non-XQB function can also be traced. An example to use this is to trace external state External state lookup functions. So there are four external state lookup functions in kernel which are not XQB functions at all. And so we can now we can trace them to understand if they are called in, and, and in when they are called. The last point is the um, special case when XQB are revealed. For example, when an XQB is going across network namespace and via VIP, uh, the VIP would be attached to an XQB program. Kernel handle this case by consuming the original SKB and rebuild the new SKB. But the new SKB has incidentally switched network status and payload. But this was external for us because consuming the SKB can cause us losing track of SKB because we, even we enable the track SKB, it's the new SKB, so the three pointer address change. Uh, but now, right now, Peru understand this rebuild behavior, so you, you, do, you don't have to care about this special cases, so we can continue tracing the new SKB long after review. So that's very useful. Yeah, that's everything I want to 